This is Kandahar Air Base, the lifeline for the combat zone in southern Afghanistan. Outside the wire, a vicious war is escalating. But inside, it's a break from reality. Do you know what? I could be in the high street back home. We've been here for the past four months, giving a window into a surreal world. There's been highs and lows. We've taken an IED strike. We have one man trapped underneath that vehicle. Not to mention a few surprises. Ooh, the things I do for charity. Kandahar is the biggest NATO base in the world. With a billion pounds worth of hardware and 14,000 people behind the fence, it needs to be protected. And that's down to the RAF regiment, the infantry of the Royal Air Force. It's 6 a.m. and A flight have been on call all night, in uniform and boots, ready to go at a moment's notice. Young gunner Nathan Chules was fresh out of training when he was sent to Afghanistan. I don't really talk much in the morning, even me. Not a morning person whatsoever. Shift over, they're off to get some breakfast. One thing I like about being here and going to the American mess and getting pancakes for breakfast. That's brilliant. Especially when you feel like in the morning. <laughs> How much sleep have you had? I've had quite a bit actually. About, yeah, about four and a half hours. Who are you used to do? I find now that on my day off, if I have like more than six hours sleep, I feel like I've overslept. Four months ago, Charles's squadron were getting ready to leave the UK. He'd never been abroad before. This is my first holiday, going to Afghanistan. It's been brilliant. <laughs> His boss, Sergeant Bennett Jones, had to keep a close eye on all the brand new recruits. I'm pretty much their dad, and I think any dad would agree with me. Uh, having a child is very stressful, <laughs> all right? Um, now imagine having 30 kids to look after at once. It's a massive learning curve for them, and uh, you'll see the difference from now to the end of the tour, uh, massively grown-up people. i get on the bus now, right? Jonesy was about to become a dad for real, leaving behind his fiancée, Lucy, who was pregnant with their first baby. It's just a bit nerve-wracking now, because I'm not going to see him until he gets back after the baby's born, so... scary, I suppose. <laughs> Now, the squadron's two-thirds of the way through their tour of duty. <laughs> and Jonesy's just got some news. The phone call from uh, my missus' family saying Lucy's water had broke. I spoke to her about, probably about two hours later, and she was actually very quiet on the phone. And I asked, why are you so quiet? And she said, because she was in a hospital ward. And then she said, obviously, I've just, you know, just given birth to our little daughter. So, yeah. So it's quite exciting. And uh, I haven't really slept since then. I've just been walking around and pacing around and just doing stuff and just trying to keep busy. He can't get on a flight for a couple of days, so won't be able to see his new baby just yet. I wish I was there, and I'm gutted I missed it in a way. Um, but it still doesn't stop what I'm doing here. He's got to lead a fact-finding mission outside the wire. He and his lads get kitted up for a two-day patrol. Charles is on top cover. This road here leads all the way to Kandahar City. It's one of the main transit points. It's one of the ones we keep an eye on the most. This is one of the most dangerous roads in Afghanistan. 
you go past someone who will make sure they've stopped and on the side of the road. Because you never know what they got in it. If the drivers don't stop, they get a warning. They didn't fire at them, they just fired it into a bit of dead ground beside him. The regiment finds some suspicious holes by the side of the road. Improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, are one of the regiment's biggest threats. Five of the squadron have already been injured by these roadside bombs. There were three holes, even they spread apart. They plant IEDs and holes. They dig, they dig in and dig them in. This is something we look for, keep an eye on. This time, the holes are empty. They continue their journey. But there's a taxi that isn't stopping as it should. I don't like vehicles follow me at that distance. Any driver could be a suicide bomber. They could blow up at any time. We would like to keep them at 100 metres. Stupid. Pisses me off. So you've got nothing better to do with it like that. Try and end it. I would love to know how they think they really would. Just to know why they just want to kill us. The suspect vehicle stops to let the regiment pass. But the stress is getting to Jules. It does drain you mentally, and emotionally, and physically. You just basically. It's a proper drain. I don't know how I'm going to feel at the end of these six months. The convoy's heading to a summer house belonging to the brother of the Afghan president. He hardly ever goes there, but the regiment wants to check it out. That's where we're going over there. The building in between the two lights on the lower ground, because no, nobody knows what goes on in there. Nobody knows what's in there. That compound is within our area of responsibility. Um, so even though it's, it's pretty much owned by, you know, President Karzai's brother, we still need to know about it. We will try diplomatically gaining access. Just get in there, take pictures of place. Gonna get information on stuff like the security force, uh, how many people they have in there at certain times, you know, all the usual pertinent questions. The servants let them in. Very nice, isn't it? Isn't it? It's hilarious. It's nice. yeah. They get the layout and the contents of the house. Oh, get a photo of these books as well. Jonesy wants to know what other guns are kept in the house. What sort of weapons? PKM. PKM, yeah. AK. Yeah. RPG. RPG. And they, they keep all that here, do they? With the letter Sarai. Just the letter Sarai. Yes. When he comes here, does he bring his own security force with him? More people? Yeah. Like bodyguards and... Yes. Thank you. Okay, mate. Uh, there's nothing seriously dodgy in it. There was one room that was locked. Uh, that's his sleeping quarters. I haven't got the authority to, you know, obviously break into him because I'm not doing a, you know, a, an actual search. So it's, it's just a normal rich person's house within the area. Coming up, what happens if you mess with a Gurkha? And a Hercules pilot prepares to take a hit. Last night on Kandahar Air Base, there was a rocket attack. It hit the main airstrip. Although no one was injured, a C-130 Hercules was damaged. Herc pilot Chris Phillips, better known as Chap, has come to have a look. There was a big gash in there where a piece of shrapnel had gone straight through the fuselage and into the cargo compartment. The window up there has, uh, has taken an impact. And then there's two more big holes in the wing. We're very lucky that we didn't get other aircraft damaged because obviously they're all in line. The Hercules is the main aeroplane for transporting troops and supplies around Afghanistan. There are only four out here, so they can't afford to be one herc down. I noticed the major damage to the, to the front of the fuselage is already being fixed. Well, from what I gather, they're doing a scab patch repair. They're going to blend the damage out by the side of the screen and replace the screen. 
the bodywork expert's got to be careful where he points his drill. As you can see, the repair is right behind the main air conditioning unit for the whole of the aircraft. So um, pretty dark in there, and access is pretty difficult, to be honest. Uh, you push straight down the stand here? Yeah. yeah. The shrapnel's ripped straight through the wing and into the internal piping for cabin pressure. I'll leave edge. Yeah. We were quite lucky with the fact that uh, there was no one at the aircraft. So easily, it could have been a crew crane in, it could have been the engineers working on it, and then we'd be in a different situation. The attack was a near miss for the RAF's movers who load the planes with cargo. Boss man Sergeant Carl Eccleston, better known as Ecky, was on duty when the rocket hit. It went off really loud. You know, you could feel the pebbles hitting everything. Anybody, anybody who says they're not frightened is a liar. They really are. You know, I've, I've, I've had many, many, many go off. And I asked, you know, you still. You still Check yourself when you get up to make sure there's no damp patches. You know, you do. You do yourself. Ecky and his movers have to shift around 100 tonnes of cargo a day to and from the aircraft. They work for all the different NATO forces based here. With one Hercules down, the cargo's now piling up on the runway. All right, and how much does it weigh? Right, and that was coming from, from Bastion, was it? I'll be honest with you, mate. Everybody's kit is a, is a priority one, mate. It's a logistics nightmare and gets even more tricky when one of the bosses higher up the chain tries to call in a favour. You've got a rank structure within the forces uh, and a lot of people will try and use that. All right. They'll come on the phone straight away and it's kind of, you know, right, I need this, I'm so sorry, I need this, we're doing that, you will do that. And you're like, well, I'm sorry, but that won't happen, no, we can't do that. And it's like, right, do you realise how I am? Like, well, you know, at the end of the day, have a coke and a smile. Do one. Do you know what I mean? Do one. Come back and tell me who's won. A big load's just arrived on the runway, and the Belgian Air Force want it moved to their compound. We right. need a forklift. OK. It's just in front of the camp, uh, Roberts. All right, you want it to go to Count Roberts? Yes. Billy! Will you take it off and then take it up to Count Roberts for him? Nice one, big boy. The movers have a fleet of forklifts. And they're going to need the biggest one they've got to shift some flat pack accommodation blocks. So they'll bring a low loader down, and we'll, uh, we'll put on some low loader. Then they'll follow him back in the cat, and then, uh, and then do the offload for him. Spread it out, mate, just a little bit. <laughs> Nice one, big boy. We just make it happen, you know what I mean? It's just the way it is, you know? Sip of a British lip and all that, you know? With the lorry loaded up, they start their slow six-mile journey over to the Belgian camp. Ecky has to deal with requests from 28 different countries. French, Italian, whatever. Sometimes there's a language barrier. Where do you want it, mate? We're waiting for two, two piece. One piece and a left and one piece and right. OK, mate, yeah, we can do that. Okay. We can do that for you. Uh, uh, you can always get by. You can always understand what they're on about. It might take a little bit longer. You can always converse in, in some way, shape or form. Start there, Mill. You tell me when to stop, mate, yeah? Okay. Nice one, big boy. Yes, good. Very nice. It's a good service. In typical Belgian fashion, they offer the movers a beer. We can't drink beer. Belgian beer. We can't do beer, mate. We're dry. Dry. We can't drink beer. No, we can't drink beer. We can't drink beer, mate. We're dry. Uh, a soft drink. You have a soft drink? Soft drink, please, yeah. <laughs> I am gutted, I tell you, I am really gutted. Turning down beer, Emily. Fanta, please, Fanta, if I may, Fanta. Um, yeah, Fanta. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mate, thanks a lot. Thank you for the No service. problem, no problem. See you later, big boy. <laughs> Take it easy, men, all right? See you later, mate. Thanks a lot. All 
the supplies that are flown into the base are stored in warehouses. Everything the troops need in Afghanistan from uniforms to ration packs. NATO employs a hundred Gurkhas to run this part of the operation. Corporal Yogi Limbu is one of the supervisors. When we pack it, we check it again. Yeah, yeah. We check it again so that the guys get right quantity, not exactly more, the right, not, not, not less. less. Yeah, yeah, spot on. He's got to make sure his team's got the right order for a delivery that's going out on the next Hercules. We have everything here for about 8,000 soldiers, clothing kit, boots, jacket, trousers, softy jackets, camel pack, uh, inner thermals, everything here basically. Jay Frost is Yogi's boss. So is all of this going to Lashkagar? Yeah, most of them are going to Lashkagar. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, the best way that I've managed to get my head around it is to think of the place a bit like the Amazon warehouse or perhaps, you know, somewhere like Argos. If a, a shopper comes into the store, uh, that kit will be sorted and placed into a lane for them. The Gurkhas are dedicated soldiers in the combat zone and their work ethic's just the same in the warehouse. They work together, very, very close-knit teams and sort of second-guess each other a lot more. I'm not saying that British soldiers can't do that, but uh, Gurkhas more so. Even though we are working inside a fence, we work for the guys in the outside, so we are giving our best to support them. When he's not working, Yogi finds time to be goalkeeper for the Gurkhas football team. They've made it into the Inter-Service Cup final, and they're up against the Marine Expeditionary Force. Whatever it takes, we are going to win this. But the Gurkhas are fired up. Oh, they're going to lose. They're going to lose. Yeah. Lose again, yeah. We're going to win. The Gurkhas have got a reputation for being tough as nails, both off and on the pitch. <laughs> but this time, they're well and truly beaten. 9-3 to the opposition. <laughs> but Yogi's philosophical about the defeat. Yes! To get in the final, we have to win each and every single match, so it was hard to get there, but we did well, I think, yeah. Back at the runway, pilot Chap has come to visit the injured Hercules and finds it's all fixed up and ready to go again. It's the time, really, that's impressed me. You know, I, I thought this was going to be out for a long while. Yeah, and yeah, here we are. So they've replaced all the glass, resealed it, fixed the wing on the inside there where the shrapnel went through the leading edge. There were two big cuts in the fuselage. I wouldn't be surprised if this aircraft spends the rest of its life flying with these two little panels on. Uh, it'll have its own war story. The Herc crew's next mission is to make a delivery to the front line. But just when they thought it was good to go, they found another problem. One of the tyres was quite worn. So the last thing we need is a blowout on landing. We'll get it changed here. It'll only take 45 minutes. This is no mean feat when your tyre weighs over 30 stone and you're jacking up a 50-tonne plane. But it's not a job for a pilot. I'm going to have a cup of tea. <laughs> and then I'll come out and obviously inspire them, a bit of morale. Over to the loadies. Well, worst, worst case scenario, it could be 70 tonnes. It's not quite that heavy to me. It looks strenuous work. I'm slightly out of breath, but I'll recover soon. It's just the jack up bit, obviously, the wheel you know, weighs a couple hundred kilos itself, but it's all about technique. In true pilot fashion, see, we just pitch up, cup of tea, bacon roll. Everything all right? Yeah, great work. It's a bit of motivation. The RAF's movers arrive with the Herc's load, a spare engine for a stranded Chinook that's broken down at a forward operating base. 
This is the uh, the engine and some other bits and bobs. Assorted freight. Hard, keep going. Joe, the Herc Lodi, guides it on board. It's got to be straight. If it's not straight, it'll just jam and you'll never get it on. So we're going to load this one onto the main floor, then a baggage pallet onto the ramp here, and hopefully we'll be gone. A Hercules is a large and valuable target for the Taliban. They try to attack them on a regular basis. So, Lodi Joe is on the lookout for anyone launching a missile. But five minutes into the flight, the onboard defence mechanisms are triggered. Flares are launched to divert any heat-seeking missiles, and pilot Chap prepares his crew for a possible hit. You assume the worst straight away, and uh, you want to get eyes out to make sure that there isn't something coming towards you. So that's uh, why we've got the observers down the back. Joe confirms it's a false alarm. Oh, that concentrates the night. I can only think it wasn't happy, so it's just fired them as a safety. Just let me bring in the confidence, I must admit. No. Well, it makes me more confident, actually, because I know it works. After the break, the Herc attempts a desert landing. Oh, I reckon I'm there now. OK, on lap 100, man. Speed is 20 knots fast. And Jonesy leaves his lads to meet his daughter. It still feels a bit weird at the moment, because I haven't actually seen her. So, yeah, looking forward to that one. The Hercules crew are 80 miles north of Kandahar Air Base, dropping off a new engine to a Chinook that's broken down at Tarin Kaut. Pilot Chap has to land the plane on a patch of desert in hostile territory. I reckon I'm there now. OK, on lap 500, man. Speed is 20 knots fast. The strip is rough ground that's been demined, cleared of debris and rolled. It's quarter of the length of a normal runway, so Chap's got to land right at the front in a marked out area the size of a tennis court. Speeds seven, seven knots fast. The big difference with the strip is we have to ensure, because it's shorter, it's narrower, that we land when we need to land. If you bounce, you've got to go around. And you know, believe it or not, you, a big aircraft like this, you can actually bounce it. 80 feet. 40. 20. If he overshoots the runway, he could end up in a minefield. Nervous. He slams on the brakes and puts the engines into reverse. The Hercules is an easy target for the Taliban when it's on the ground, so the delivery needs to be quick. Looking at the next step ahead, and I'm thinking about where I'm going to park. OK, 30 knots, please on the control. Where people are on the ground, whether we've got any threats. So you never really switch off, you can't in this environment. You're clear, mate. OK, stop in there. Thank you, man. Right, parking brakes on. You're clear out the back. The loadies hand the Chinook engine over to the engineers to get the stranded helicopter back up and running. OK, it's going to be uh, MOS departure. And the Herc crew get more cargo for their next stop, the capital city, Kabul. Around Afghanistan, there are lots of strips, but it is not the norm, the way we operate the aircraft. 
you can ever call a strip an everyday thing. Right, Jake. Clear up, please. Bells. Once they're out of the hostile zone, they can relax a bit. Reconfirm spot in 0373. Oh, it's beautiful outside. Good time of day to be flying, isn't it? Oh, ideal, though, in terms of the security of the aircraft, we find during the day. At night, we're obviously less conspicuous, but uh, it will be dark by the time we get to Kabul. So, yeah, we get to see beautiful views like this. An hour later, they arrive in Kabul. They deliver their cargo and reward themselves after a stressful day. We finally made it uh, so that we can actually uh, pick up some food. Uh, Thai, the most amazing curries. Good bit of morale boost, really, for the guys. Right in the middle of Kabul's airbase, there's a Thai takeaway. Green curry, please. Green curry, chicken or beef, sir? Uh, chicken, please. Chicken, yes. I have a cashew nut, cashew nut. with uh, steamed rice, please. Lots of chilies. <laughs> OK. He did tell me that specifically. I did warn him, but now he wanted it. After picking up their takeaway, the crew head back to Kandahar. Thanks again, the grub chap. Pleasure. Oh, chap leaves the flying to his co-pilot and plays trolley dolly microwaving their in-flight meals. How is yours? You said you wanted it hot. Oh, did he ask for it extra freshly hot? It's hot. <laughs> is it actually consumable, though? Yeah, it's actually very what? tasty. Yeah. Gentlemen, down the back, do you want anything? To round off a perfect dinner, coffee's all round. I just poured milk everywhere. And the crap is porous in the world. Perhaps he should stick to the day job. On a busy airbase, there are plenty of everyday hazards that could injure the troops and civilians living here. So, there are strict rules that need to be enforced, and one man is in charge of this. The RAF's head of safety, squadron leader Steve O'Neill. Well, they started calling me uh, Safety Steve, because obviously, uh, Chief of Safety. Do you want a brew, Carl? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. Coming up, mate. Coming up. One of my key uh, personnel is Warrant Officer Carl Dowdell, who, who I call Careful Carl. Now, he's the explosive safety expert. That's one of Carl's wife's... Actually, they're my sister-in-law's biscuits. Oh, I beg you, I thought it was the wife. Right. They're rock hard, and they are the new SAS of biscuits for Dunkey. They cause you dental damage. Again! Tip me again! Safety Steve and careful Carl are off to inspect the base. Their first stop, the rubbish tip. Where locals are employed by a private contractor to sort through 60 tonnes of rubbish a day. I must admit, they do a fantastic job. They do, I mean, uh, and they all do it with a smile on their face, which I don't know where I, else you would get that. I, tell, I don't think you'd find it anywhere in no. uh, Britain, that's for sure, but no, it's, it's not something I'd like to do. The rubbish is put into separate piles. Food gets buried, paper and cardboard's burnt, plastic goes into a toxic waste unit, and there's one special burn pit. As uh, well as medical waste, we actually do uh, cremations for military dogs. OK. We, we cremated one last week that had, was awarded two medals, and uh, the soldiers come back and collect the ashes right. and ship it back to the uh, States. And that, and that would just be for the, the military dogs, you, you know, the, the wild dogs. dogs that... The wild dogs we put in the, uh, the big oh. burners. In the, really in the pit of Hades. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. OK. I mean, well, I guess these dogs were considered soldiers, right? Yeah, they, uh, yeah. I, I don't know how the US is. I'm sure it's the same as us. But uh, that our uh, dogs in the Royal Air Force are called airmen, you know, air, air dogs, okay. I beg uh, your I pardon. Steve and Carl's next job is to collect ammunition that's been dumped by the troops coming back to base. 
The soldiers aren't allowed to carry any live bullets or grenades on them unless they're on duty. So there are ammo bins around the camp, and they fill up pretty quickly. Let's see what goodies we've got. Let's have a little look. Lovely jubbly. So we've got about uh, three or four days' worth in here. Lots of Eastern European ammunition. I feel like a Mexican bandit with this amount of ammo. These are 40 millimeter high explosive uh, rounds that are fired from the armored vehicles, all can be fired from uh, specially adapted weapons carried by the soldiers. Some uh, high explosive rounds that are used on the um, Canadian armored vehicles. A couple of nice presents for us. These are high explosive frag grenades, no longer needed by the troops. We have a couple of flashbangs there and smoke grenades. The important aspect of this is the total amnesty, so people know that they can put stuff in here with impunity. There'll be no comeback, and that helps us get rid of the stuff safely. Whereas if they thought, I better not put something like that in there because questions will be asked, then they wouldn't do it, then we've got the problem. Hence the interesting array of goodies we're picking up. Look at that, we've even got a round with uh, Bin Laden's name on it. Does that mean if he kept it in his pocket, he'd be safe? Because everyone's got a bullet with their name on. And so... Thank you, safety, Steve. All the ammo needs to be blown up, so Steve and Carl hand their haul over to the Explosive Ordnance Unit. My job today is to, is to dispose of all this unserviceable munition. If the coalition forces, we're going to use the ammunition that we have in here. It might not work because it has an old shelf life. So we blow it up and take it off the street so the enemy can't use it. The regiment lads are heading back to base after being outside the wire on patrol. They've been sleeping in the desert where the temperature at night has dropped to minus 10. It's like getting up in the morning like that. Full softy suit on, balaclava, everything. Every bit of warm kit I had, it was still cold. What, <laughs> that's frost? Yeah. That's frost. That's frost! Hey, is there any frost there? Bit of frost right there. What? My morale has gone down massively. I can't imagine what it's going to be like this time next month. Because it hasn't even started raining yet. It's just the beginning of winter. And I'm really hating it. Charles's boss, Jonesy, is packing to go back to the UK. He's got a month's leave because two days ago, his fiance gave birth to a little girl. It still feels a bit weird at the moment because I haven't actually seen her yet. I think when I actually see her for the first time, I'll pick her up then, yeah. I think, yeah, it'll be massively different. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. He's got a 15-hour journey, flying the first leg on a C-17 Globemaster. For the rest of the troops, it's business as usual. Most of them spend at least four months away from home. Men outnumber women by 15 to 1. In this male-dominated world, the pin-up girl industry thrives. It helps morale. Lifts everybody's spirits. Just reminds us what we're missing back home, really. Well, everybody's got the favourite side. Mine's obviously my wife. In London, the Nuts magazine team are planning a trip to take the latest issue out to Kandahar. Are oh, there not other shots of him, of him actually like, being in the bikinis or something? Deputy editor Nick Soldinger will be going laden with presents for the troops getting together things uh, like T-shirts and calendars that we're going to get signed by some of the glamour girls who are coming in today. Oh, hello, <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry, <laughs> distracted. Good <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, sorry. It's cold outside. I know you should be right <laughs> No, you're all right, girl. When I think that they've got our pictures on the wall, I think it, it makes me feel really nice inside. It's like, yeah, me too. I don't know, it's just like... You're doing it a little bit, at least. Because I mean, it could be anybody, but it's us yeah. on their wall. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It just means we'll bring a little bit of sunshine to the day. And it's like when they wake up first thing in the morning, that's what they see. Big, busted British ladies <laughs> like ourselves. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Nick's going to be doing a story for the magazine about the RAF regiment. We care about them. You know, these guys have been writing to us since day one. You know, they've helped support us through the years. You know, this is us saying thanks very much, guys, and, and giving a little bit back. Up next, the lads from Nuts meet their heroes. They're very, very impressive young men. And Jonesy meets Maisie. It's just quite a weird feeling. It's quite nice, though. <laughs>
albeit I am just like a bloody idiot, but uh, I think it's cheered them up a little bit. Nick's here to do a serious job too. A few of the lads have stayed behind to be interviewed. I'm Nick from Nuts Magazine. Last year, gunner Ben Wharton was shot in the chest when he was providing cover for his mates who were under fire. I'll just let you, you go with it, basically. He was saved by his body armour and got straight back up and carried on firing at the enemy. So we, we, the foot patrol had moved off and we'd, we'd taken the vehicles off and then we got a, a radio message that we'd got a man down. He held his cover for over an hour, allowing his injured comrades to be rescued. I think it's important for the, the story that soldiers have to be heard, just to understand the magnitude of some of the things that we have to do. It's pretty humbling to hear them, you know, talk about friends that they've lost. Do you know what I mean? This is this is this is real and dirty and smelly and, and hard and life and, de and death, you know. And, and that's what these guys deal with every day. And you know, we don't understand that because we don't have to live it. But if you're in London every time, give me a shout. We'll go for a beer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd like to buy one. A great story, mate. <laughs> Cheers again. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I didn't think it would be possible, but my admiration for for the people serving in these these theatres is. Uh, is now, you know, tenfold probably was before I came on this trip. So they're very, very impressive young men. One squadron's got another two months to serve in Afghanistan. 21-year-old gunner Nathan Jules started his tour with such high hopes. It is the best job in the world. I'd even recommend it to my own mother. That's how confident I am about this job. He and his mates trained hard to do a difficult job. Lads, if you put your knees down, you owe me a dollar. One, two. Now they've patrolled hostile territory in both 40 degree heat and freezing conditions, day and night, constantly on the lookout for an invisible enemy. Basically someone's signaling that they know what we're doing, basically. Nathan Chules got to see the real Afghanistan. Makes you think that your house at home isn't that really that bad. <laughs> Look what these people live in. They're horrendous. It does make you think. And with five of his mates wounded at the hands of the Taliban, the reality of war has taken its toll. Oh, I can't wait to go. I really can't wait to go. I'm actually counting down the days. Because mentally, it's you up. I feel like I've aged like 20 years since I've been out here. Charles's squadron will eventually be replaced by the Queen's Colour Squadron. But with no end to the war in sight, Kandahar Air Base will continue to grow. And NATO's presence will remain in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. The Harrier Squadron supporting ground troops from the air. Just a direct hit on suspect compound. I don't particularly enjoy blowing up compounds, to be honest with you. It's not really what we're about, but we help the, the coalition troops stop the guys who are in, who are in trouble. So, yeah, mixed emotions are really The Chinook crews saving lives on the front line. You can't switch off for a second because you've got to keep your eyes out, keep looking ahead. And the Hercules pilots dropping vital supplies into Helmand province. We are providing them with something that would cost lives if they got it there by road. Thousands more young men and women will be sent out to serve their country in a war a long way from home. One of the team puts family first while the rest of his colleagues work a case, but in the Navy, that's one way to lose your job. NCIS is next on five.